This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. Hello, college football fans, and welcome to the Primetime Podcast. Ricky Widmer here, joined, as I always am, by the young Brandon Swanson. Hey, hey, hey. And Brandon, we've got, at first we're like, man, what do we talk about this week? A really win and you're in week this week. Where Alabama, they win, they go. Clemson, they win their conference championship, they go. Whoever wins the Big Ten championship, they go. That fourth spot, though, in the college football playoff. We'll talk about that one in a second. So I think we're going to start with head coaches. We got USC, got a new head coach, Les Miles. He's staying in LSU. And when you texted me that, I went, really? Just because he won? Like, hours before the game, they were saying that he was like, oh, this is my last game. I told the boosters and everyone, this is my last game. Now he's staying? Well, what I think it was is that when some more reports came out was not that he was telling the boosters that this is my last game, but he was talking to the boosters as if it could be his last game, really giving them a lot of thank yous for the support that they've had for him Mm -hmm. and his staff throughout the many years that he's been there since one since when 2005 i think he's been there i think he started in 2005 won a national championship in 07 i mean i'm not completely sure i'm pretty positive that's when he started but les miles you hear his name 05 is when he started in lsu you hear his name and and you just think success you think successful programs guys who love him and i think the guys are really loving this decision to keep him. Well, and I mean, the one thing, you were right, 05 for now, he's been there. 07 was when he won a national championship. I want to say that was either over Oklahoma or OSU. You forgot, though, he's been to the national title game twice. The second time, he lost to number one Alabama or number two Alabama. can't remember what they were. That was the Trent Richardson Roll Tide team that just ran all over yeah, so LSU. What, five years ago? Yeah, uh, two th- four years ago, four. 2011. So he's been there twice. He's been at LSU for a while, and part of me then feels like, is this a situation where it's like, you know what, I got to get rid of my girlfriend. I got to get rid of her. She's no good. And then she just comes home, and it's like, you know what, I just want to tell you that you're the best. You're great. Thank you for putting up with everything. And then you just look and go, I can't get rid of you. That's what it feels like to me. After hearing what you just said, that's the situation it feels like. Like you know, the girlfriend came home and was like, man, you're the best. Thanks for putting up with me. And the boyfriend just said, ah, I love you. I can't get rid of you. Well, you know, maybe they realized that it would have been a rash decision. Maybe they looked around and they thought, Whoa, who is going to be better yeah. than Les Miles? <laughs> Who's out there, Chip I mean, Kelly? But but I mean that's the that's the thing. And um, I th- Jimbo Fisher I think was the name. He that, was that, the that, top I mean he candidate. was he was the top yep. person that that was being rumored out there. But Jimbo Fisher, Les Miles. I'm taking Les Miles over Jimbo Fisher. Well, I mean Jimbo Fisher this year proved I can't win without Jameis Winston. I mean. Yeah, they have a winning record this year, but it's nowhere near the success they had with Jameis Winston. I mean, you could even throw E.J. Manuel because they were really good. Jimbo Fisher, unless he has the quarterback, it's not going to go to any college football playoffs or win the ACC. And it didn't work out this year with with Golson. He was injured, um, and he was probably less than what they thought he would be. And... And quite honestly, Les Miles, the only reason, the absolute only reason why there was even the rumor, even the talk that he would be out at LSU is because he had a three-game stretch where they did not win. Mm -hmm. And if they would have beat Alabama, it wouldn't have mattered. It would not have mattered. And as I've looked around and and, and stuff on, on, on the internet with a number of articles, what people are saying, and it's kind of funny is that the reason why the topic that we're going, the main topic we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. And the reason 
why LSU almost ousted Les Miles is because of who? Nick Saban. Because he is the epitome of, college of a football. college coach. And the SEC. I mean, e- exactly. he's, ever since he's come back from Miami and the Dolphins, not the U, but ever since he came back from the NFL, he's been the guy. That's him. He's been the college football coach. And the one thing, kind of, you mentioned it, the main topic, we're going to get there. I was going to subtly sway into it. Looking at Les Miles, just his coaching records, he's only had, out of his entire career, both at his four years at Oklahoma State from 01 to 04, and then at LSU, he's only had one losing season. And that was his first year at OK State. When he went four and seven. Since then, he's had a winning season at LSU. The least amount of wins he's got is he's gotten eight wins three times. So you're looking at this record going, okay, he's got 101 wins to 32 losses overall at LSU. He's got 61 and 27 in the SEC. Pretty good, right? Pretty good. Yeah. However, records don't save you because. Then you look at a guy like Mark Rick, who since 01, he's been with the George Bulldogs, 145 and 51 overall, 83 and 37 in the conference. The least amount of wins he had was, it's not as impressive as Les Miles. He did have a six and seven season back in 2010, but this is a guy that every single year, and this year was not going to be different, has made it to a bowl game with the Bulldogs. He's made it to a bowl, bowl game. The only difference is he's never been to the big one. And that's the problem. Because he'd probably lose it. That's the problem. I mean, he won nine games this year. His team won nine games this year. But of those three that they lost, how about this? They lost to Alabama. At the time, the number 13 team in the nation. They didn't just lose to Alabama. They got blown out by Alabama, 38-10. to 10. And I remember this was week five, and I picked Georgia to beat Alabama. I, think we both I never did. picked against Alabama again, and I don't know why I ever picked against them. Just a bad feeling I must have had that day. The week after, they played an unranked Tennessee team. They lost 38-31. to 31. And then just two weeks later, at home, they got embarrassed by Florida, who was number 11 at the time, and they lost 27-3. to And what it really comes down to at the end of the day, it's not the amount of losses you had, because you're 9-3, most teams, they're going to be extremely happy that's a winning season. But it's the type of losses you had, and to who the losses were against. If you lose to Alabama, bad. If you lose to Florida, bad. If you lose to Tennessee at all, that's not acceptable. Each year, you're always looking on your resume. You've got to beat Alabama, or you've got to be very competitive. Same thing against Florida. Same thing against any of those teams. Auburn's another one. And if you can't do that, And if that happens for multiple years in a row, you're done. We'll find someone else who can. Well, and you could arguably say that that Missouri game this year should have been a loss. It was a 9-6 game. Now, here's the thing. After the Tennessee loss, every game after that, part of me, a little bit of part of me says, okay, take every loss after that, the Florida one, with a grain of salt because – who did they not have ever since he got injured during the Tennessee game? Nick Chubb. They didn't have Nick Chubb. And I mean Nick Chubb on the year in his five games against Louisiana Monroe, 16 carries, 120 yards, two tutties. At Vanderbilt, 19 carries, 189 yards, didn't get a tutty. South Carolina, 159 yards, 21 carries, two tutties. In week four, 15 carries, 131 yards, three tutties, and against Alabama, 20 carries, 146, and a single tutty. Guy knew how to get into the end zone. So part of me 
is like, okay, maybe that Florida loss was them being able to say, okay, what do we do life after Nick Chubb? But also another part of me feels like this move was, okay, we're, and this is me talking to Georgia fans. Where do you want to be right now? Are you happy with a coach that'll get you 10 wins, 11 wins, 13 one year? He can get you that double digit, can get you nine wins. We'll go to a bowl game and you'll win that bowl game. They have one, two, three, four, five losses in X amount of years that he has had. Only five bowl losses. Are you happy with a bowl win or do you want to get to the big game? And I feel this was Georgia saying, hey, you know what? We want to get to the big game. We need a quarterback that's going to do, or not a quarterback. We need a coach that's going to do it. But they need a quarterback as well because ever since Austin Murray left, it hasn't been the same. Well, that's true. And I and I, I completely agree with you because it's it's not just getting wins. It's about getting good wins. It's about getting big wins. It's about getting the win. And that's what Mark Rick wasn't doing. You And you said it earlier. He wasn't going to the big game. He wasn't getting there. And you brought it up yourself saying that if he did, he probably wouldn't win it. And no, that's, he wouldn't. And, and that's, but that's the biggest thing. And it comes down to confidence, too, as well. I mean, how much confidence do you have in your coach to keep getting, having good winning seasons but really winning nothing, you know? I, I think that programs get really tired after only winning a ball game, a meaningless ball game. Okay, great. You won the Chick-fil-A ball. Oh, you won the, you know, Tost- Tostitos Fiesta ball. You didn't win the Rose Bowl. You didn't win the Money Bowl. I, maybe the Fiesta Bowl, I mean... Of course, the Fiesta Bowl is not. It doesn't have a nickname like the granddaddy of them all. However, I would almost say that winning the Fiesta Bowl for some teams may be the same as the Rose Bowl. But, only but you be, know what I mean. Because, but you know what I yeah, mean. It's only not the, the big Rose, game. Only because the Rose Bowl has been in years past, and it still is, unless one of the two teams is in the playoff, the Rose Bowl has always been Big Ten, Pac-12. That's been the Rose Bowl. So, I mean, of course, an SEC team has never had the chance. Or there may have been some in the past, but they're not usually the team that gets picked for the Rose Bowl. And part of me, though, feels like, and I'm looking back, the one season, Rick's best season as head coach of Georgia was his second season, 2002. Went 13-1, and won the Sugar Bowl, went 7-1, and in the SEC, here were their games that year. Played Clemson. Twelve, they were 12th. Played Clemson. Beat them. Moved up to 10. Played South Carolina on the road. Beat them 13-7. to Then played Northwestern State. They blew them out. New Mexico State blew them out. At number 22, Alabama. Beat them by two points. At Brian Denny Stadium. Then played number 10, Tennessee at home. Beat them 18 to 13. Beat Vanderbilt on the road or at home. Beat Kentucky on the road. Sitting there nice and pretty, undefeated still. At number five, they went to play number 22 Florida in Altel Stadium in Jacksonville and lost. Lost 20 to 13. It was their only loss. Beat Old Miss. Beat number 20, 24 Auburn. Beat Georgia Tech, Arkansas and then beat Florida State in the Sugar Bowl. Guess what the national championship was that year? Do you know? I'll give you a hint. I'm I'm, I'm giving you a hint. Miami. Miami versus Ohio State. That was the one where it was the Hurricanes going for their back-to-back, and they got the pass interference called on them in the end zone, and everyone celebrates – They call pass interference, and everyone's like, whoa, what's going on? It was Coker's first year Yeah, yeah. Uh as head coach of Miami. It was when Butch Davis had left to go to the Cleveland Browns. 
that was the national championship. So we may have, like, if Georgia went undefeated, there was a chance that we have would have saw the Hurricanes versus the Bulldogs because the Hurricanes were number one. They were going to be number one. And that was a BCS system at the time and that favored SEC teams throughout its entire run as the BCS computer. Yeah. I, you know, it just it still comes down to what did you do? Where did you get us? And, and Rick just wasn't getting them far enough. Now, that's in the mind of clearly your athletic director, your boosters. But, Ricky, what I've been reading, what I've been hearing, players aren't happy about this. What does this do for the players that are not very happy about their head coach, who they favored, who they liked, getting fired? What does this do for this club? This is a lose-lose situation. For Georgia, I mean, not for the fans, not for the players. I mean, for the AD, the boosters, this was a lose-lose. Because if you keep Mark Rick, you're thinking, okay, we're just accepting, not mediocrity, but... You're sitting there going, okay, we're accepting this. We're okay with a nine-win season, an eight-win season. Hell, we may get double digits. We may go 13-1 and one year. But it's not. We're just accepting win enough games, be good enough, get to a bowl game, win the bowl game. But if you fire them like you did now, you're going to piss off your players. You're going to piss off fans. You're going to hurt some of the loved ones. This was one of those moves. Do I agree with the move? Not entirely because this is unless unless you're like, fire him, let's go get Chip Kelly. Unless that's your master plan, there's nobody out there. Think about it. You've got Fuente from Memphis. He goes to Virginia Tech. We've got, if you wanted to get Bill Cubitt in Illinois, don't know why you want to do that because the last time he was a head coach was in the MAC, and we all know what Brandon thinks about the group of five. Unless you're going out and like, okay, we're going to get a Tom Herman who's apparently talking contract extension at Houston. Who are you going to go get? Unless you're going to bring Steve Spurrier out of, and I'm using air quotes, retirement. How about this? Kirby Smart. Oh, that would be a good one. Defensive coordinator at Alabama. Here's the only then, thing. Then, 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 there you go. You've got an inside on one of the best defenses in the country, in the SEC. Mm-hmm. But would Alabama ever allow that guy to go? I, I feel like they'd throw more money at him just to make sure that he stays there and doesn't give away the team secrets. How about I throw out a different Alabama name? How about Nick Saban? <laughs> How about no How about, way in hell? Like, hey, the, there are obviously teams that have looked into him. I know that he like Tennessee hates him for leaving for USC. USC hates him because he was terrible at USC. Lane Kiffin's a good coach. May not be the best head coach, though. Lane However, Kiffin's a good offensive coordinator. Lane Kiffin has gotten some targets from teams in the past. However, Kirby Smart's the guy to go in Alabama. And, I mean, there's only one thing that is against Kirby Smart, and it's not the worst thing because it can be proven wrong. You want to know what it is? What's that? We don't know. We don't know how he's going to be as a head coach. That's the only thing. We don't know. However, like I said, that's something that's easily proven wrong. I pulled up just now. CBS Sports has an article. I'm going to throw out some names at you. I'm throwing out some names for this Georgia job. You tell me what you think. Okay. First one, Mississippi State coach Dan Mullen. Didn't have a great year with the Bulldogs this year. Dak Prescott on the way out. Does he try to move on up in the SEC? Well, you know, you talked about Georgia not being able to have a quarterback either. That's one thing that Mullen might be able to bring. Because I know Dak Prescott, I, I, this is me, I like Dak. 
I liked him in his time there at Mississippi State. Dak is going to be a special late round talent in the NFL, and he's going to fight for a job and probably make an NFL roster. I I think so too, but I think that part of that is because of Mullen. You know, you're able to really craft a good quarterback and a good head coach paired with a really good quarterback. Is it? It, it just makes for a love love relationship. So that could be interesting. Maybe you could see some some success there at Georgia if you could pair a very good quarterback with a pretty darn good head coach. See, and there's only one thing I don't like about this. You're moving within the conference, and to me, is is Georgia that much sexier of a job than Mississippi State? Unless Dan Mullen's thinking in his head, Okay, we did really well in 2014, was the number one team for a while, then fell off the wagon in 2015. Are we ever going to do that again? I don't know. Ooh, but this job over here, I mean, if if Mar could make a bowl game every single year, I could do that and better. Is that really, is Georgia that much sexier of a job than Mississippi State? That's the only qu- that's the one question I have about it. Is it really that much sexier of a job? Well, you have to pair that then with the rest of their team. I mean, it's not just about their offense. It's about all around. It's about the rest of the coaching staff. It's about defense. What team is going to give you the better opportunity to win? I, I mean, I think that that is the biggest question. Personally, I'm thinking probably Georgia. I think that Georgia is a little bit better when you pair the two together than Mississippi State. That's just me. And Georgia, I think, finds themselves in the top 25 throughout the season a lot more than Mississippi State does. Which has been the opposite this year. Mississippi State had been the one kind of floating at the bottom of the rankings, and Georgia completely fell off when it lost. Nick back Chubb. Back to back. It, yeah. And, and it was it really, it was when, it they, was when, they, when lost they lost Nick, Nick Chubb. Chubb yeah. is that's, that's when that they fell off. Because that was when they lost to Bama, lost to Tennessee. And if they if they had Nick Chubb healthy throughout the entire season, do you think Mark Rick keeps his job? Because if they had Nick Chubb, do you think no. they beat Tennessee? Well, do you think they beat Florida or at least are competitive? I mean, they lost that game 27-3. Yes. Yes. The, uh, it's a hard one to answer, too, because, I mean— it goes back to what I was talking about with not mediocr- mediocrity, but are you happy with the road you're on? This straight and narrow path of win enough games, get to a bowl game. You're not a six-win team. So it's not like my Illinois team where, oh, we're fighting for six wins. We may not get there, but we'll fight for six wins to get a bowl game. No, you're going to win eight games. You're going to be a bowl team. Just depends on which bowl game you're going to get. And then, like I said, he's only lost five of, if my math is correct, out of 14. Well, 13, because this year he won't get that bowl game. But only five out of 13 he's lost. Do you think that someone's out there to make the next jump? I think if Nick Chubb's there, he does. I'm going to go ahead and say he does not get fired. And how about this? Former Georgia AD Vince Dooley Mm -hmm. in 2000, December of 2000, he settles on Mark Rick, then Florida State's offensive coordinator. And as you have already said, Rick was at Georgia 15 years, 15 seasons. He helped the Bulldogs to a record of 145 and 51 in two SEC championships, 0205. And basically, what Georgia is trying to do now is get back to where they were in 02 and 05. I mean, it's been 10 years since they won an SEC championship. Mm -hmm. And that's what the AD currently is saying. We, Mark, this is what you did for us. Now we need someone else to come in and do that. Well, and I mean, I'm looking, this is kind of going back on a 
further point we had, but all the quarterbacks right now, and we don't know, whenever you fire a coach, obviously things change and players kind of rethink, hey, do I want to play for the new guy? But you have the main starter who led the team statistically in passing yards was Grayson Lambert. He's only a junior. He's got one more year. And looking at the rest of them, next year you would have, reading right down, Ramsey would go to a red red shirt junior, Lambert's a senior, you have Sam Vaughn, red shirt uh, shirt sophomore, Nick Robinson being your just straight-out sophomore, and you got a kid coming in from Washington who's a pro-style quarterback in this recruiting class who's number one Washington recruit, Second pro quarterback in the class, fifth overall in Jacob Eason. So they've got quarterback, like they've got a quarterback coming into an already, I don't want to say stacked quarterback, but a, I'm going to say a busy quarterback crew on the roster. Because we got to get to some championship games, I'm just going to go ahead with the next name. Tom Herman's the next one on this list. And to me, Brandon, I love Tom Herman. OSU guy, you know how much I love Big Ten football. Look at what he, I mean, okay. Group of five is the talent of opponents besides for this year. Navy, Memphis, Houston. Navy, Memphis, Houston, and Temple. Besides those four teams, has the group of five been anything special this year? Navy, Memphis, Houston, Temple. Yeah. No. Those have been the four that we've talked about the most this year. Maybe Toledo early in the year, but what he's been able to do at Houston, that's why. He's he's an Urban Meyer guy. So he comes from the Urban Meyer. Like, and he, when you talk coaches, you got to talk coaching trees. He comes from the Urban Meyer tree. Guess where Urban Meyer used to coach? You guessed it, the SEC. So he's got that SEC tie because what did you think Urban brought to the Big Ten? He brought SEC football, a little bit of SEC football to the Big Ten, and that's why he was able to run rampant with it and win a national title. So, I mean, I know that Tom Herman, Houston would be great to lock up Herman, but if I'm Georgia, I'm calling him right away. I'm calling him right away. The other two on the list, you've got, Mike Bobo, Colorado State coach, who's a offensive coordinator. And then looks like uh, CBS Sports, want they want a little Shiano men in Georgia's. Greg Shiano's the last one on this list. Do you think we should get some Shiano? Do, do the Bulldogs need some Shiano men? Is that what they need? I don't think so. Because Shiano did well at Rutgers. I think that the Bulldogs, what they need to do is they need to go with a pretty stable, consistent, so consistently like, winning head coach. So like a Mullen, Kirby Smart, or Tom Herman? Or how about this? Charlie Strong. <laughs> Larry Fedora, North Carolina. Who just got blown out by, well, not blown out, but just got beat by North Carolina. Maybe. I mean, I just said NC State. I, I just said North Carolina. Oh, I'm thinking head, NC State. Head, head coach in North Carolina. Okay. I was thinking NC State. I was thinking the other side of that game. Um, he's done good things with the Tar Heels. I mean, Tar, they're 11 and 1. Tar this Heels year. are one win away from the playoffs, I know. in my mind. I know. They beat Clemson, they're in. Because, let's be honest, not everyone's us, Brandon, puts Alabama at number one. <laughs> A lot of people put Clemson there just because they've won. Every single game. But that could be an interesting one. I mean, that's just, it's just a thought. It'd be a long shot. He'll most likely stay yeah. at North Carolina. They most likely wouldn't I, some, let him go. For but some reason, I thought you said NC State. And I was thinking red on my mind, even though I've got these nice blue Dre beats on my head. New. Very new. New. Brand an new. Early, Black Friday. Early Christmas gift. Yeah. Well, $96. You got to Did go you wrap it. it up for yourself and try no, and surprise I, yourself? I just went and got it. Just went and got I it. I just went and got it. And. And Dr. Dre, I'll be uh, expecting that check in the mail for promotion. But we got some games to get to. 
We got some conference championship games to get to. We've got great ones like Florida Bama. You're going to have the Trojans and the Cardinal at the Rose Bowl. Or not the Rose Bowl. This, that one's at Levi Stadium. I forgot they changed it. Michigan State, Iowa, North Carolina, Clemson. But, Brandon, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Before we get to the stuffings, the mashed potatoes, the turkey. No, I ate all that. You got to have your appetizer. And here's your appetizer. It's going to be played in Houston, Texas at TDECU Stadium. Temple Houston for the AAC Championship. The one group of five championship we're going to talk about. Oh, wow. Um, Virtually the winner of this game gets a New Year's Six Bowl in my mind. Because the winner of this game is going to be higher. They're going to be the highest group of five team, therefore getting a New Year's Six game. <laughs> um, I don't even know what to say. Brandon thinks that the group of five shouldn't even be nowhere near the New Year's Six. Give it to a Power Five team. Hell, give it to Georgia. That's what Brandon thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Am um, I wrong? I mean, we've talked about your hatred, well, your, not despise, your unfavorness of the group of five before, but I digress. What do you think of this game as a group of five hater? Um, you know, it's on ABC. I'm going to go with uh, the, the, the Temple Owls. Really? Going against Tom, going against my Tom Herman? I am. After Houston, I'm not going to say dismantled Navy. But they got a decisive win over Navy. Are you just saying that because Temple almost beat your uh, Notre Dame Fighting Irish? No, the Temple Owls, they forced 22 turnovers, and they currently have a turnover margin of plus six. It's pretty darn good. And um, and uh, linebacker Tyler uh, Matejkovic, he's actually been leading the charge on the defensive side. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for Temple to continue this run of really good defensive play and I, I'm thinking that we might see a low-scoring game. Possibly not. But <laughs> You say that after Houston scored 52 on Navy. Yeah. I say I, I didn't mean blowout. They blew them out 52-31. That, to me, would constitute as a blowout. Hey, hey, hey. Remember when you thought that that was going to be a good game? And I told you, Ricky, it's I not going it to be. I thought it was going to be a good game. Navy beat Memphis, and they beat Temple, I believe. Temple's a two-loss team. Houston is, honestly, Houston is a field goal loss f- against Clemson. And I just want to let you know being in the playoff that the, the Owls are 5-1 and one versus a team with a re- winning record and 5-2 and two in their last seven row and games. And let me guess, let me guess, that one is Notre Dame. That one is, right? That one is Notre Dame. And also, for the Houston Cougars, they are... Owen three and one in their last four games in December. We're gonna go right down right down the list. That, Ricky's like, screw you, Brandon. <laughs> that is not what I wanted I'm, to hear. I'm going Houston in this one just because I like the Houston Cougars. I think they're gonna get a New Year's six. Ball. Ricky doesn't really like them. He I, just pretends to because I don't. I don't know if ESPN is right on this one. I don't know why like I don't know why this would be a 11 a.m. start central time, but according to ESPN, the next game time-wise, Lucas Oil Stadium, number five versus number four, win and you're in. Michigan State, Iowa State, Big Ten, championes. See, this one uh, is, in my mind... This is the game of the week for me. It's really tough. This one's really tough for me because... We've started to see Michigan State play um, some some pretty good football. We've continued to see Iowa play really good football. The Spartans have a ton of offensive weapons. They have had huge wins over Oregon at the time. That was a big win. A big win. Field goal win at home. I want to say it was a field goal win. A big win over Michigan. An improbable fashion. <laughs> Should have lost. Huge but yeah, they win won. against Ohio State. 
It's at Nebraska. Like, even if they beat Nebraska, we're still looking at this game as a win and you're in kind of a thing because Iowa is obviously undefeated. And there may be some people out there that look at this game and go, guys, I don't know how I. There are some people that are like, how is Iowa even in the playoff discussion? Because, I mean, well, compared to Michigan State, because you just said those wins. I'm going to give you the key wins for Iowa. Number 19, Wisconsin. Number 20, Northwestern. That's it. Like, Illinois is not a good win. Maryland's not a good win. Indiana's not a great win. I, 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 may, I may give you Minnesota, but it's nothing like Michigan, Ohio State. Yeah, you beat Nebraska, something that Michigan State wasn't able to do. And in your non-conference, it was Illinois State, Iowa State, Pitt, and North Texas. So how about this? A win for Michigan State. Gets they, them in. They've got a confidence boost right now going into this Big Ten title game, and that earns them a spot in the college football playoffs. For Iowa, C.J. Beathard, quarterback has been very impressive this year. Over 2,300 yards, 14 touchdowns, three interceptions. The difference in this game for me is Jordan Kanzeri. The running back. 176 yeah. carries. He's the spark plug. For 964 yards and 12 touchdowns on the season. He's been good all season long. He's a spark And plug. what Iowa will do is something that Ohio State should have done. Run the ball. Run the ball. Iowa will shock the college football playoff committee mm-hmm. who is right in Michigan State right now. They're going to have to cross that off or erase it if they use is the that, pencil is because that, Iowa's going to win this game. Is that a Brandon prediction that the playoff committee, when they come out with their rankings tomorrow night as we record this on Monday, you think they're going to put Michigan State in the playoff over Iowa? Is that what you're saying? That's to be determined, Ricky. Okay. I think Kanziri Ken, to me is obvious. Not only did he have 140 yards and two tutties, in the regular season finale. I got to watch this guy. His best game of the year was sadly the one Iowa game. Well, second I watched last week's. But the one Iowa game where I watched every single second of. The home game against Illinois, Where he had 43 carries, 256 yards, and two tutties. Yeah, against North Texas he had four tutties. But he almost ran for 300 yards on my Illini. My Illini defense that was supposed to be improved, who still can't stop a run like it's a nosebleed. He like he's gonna be he's the factor, and he's gonna be the X factor in this game. And if Iowa wins this, not like not just this game. If they win any games in the playoff, it's going to be because of Kanziri. Because look at last year. Yeah, Ohio State had great quarterback play. But who played just as well against Alabama and against Oregon last year for OSU? Who was it, Brandon? Give me his name. He likes to complain when you lose. You mean Zeke? Zeke, man. Zeke. Zeke Elliott. What a game he had this past weekend. Who would have thunk that we'd be talking running backs when it came to Big Ten football? But let's move to the other. Eh, before we get there. The 3 o'clock game. We'll save the one I was going to get to for last. The 3 o'clock game. This could have been a win and you're in as well, but Florida had to go and lose to Florida State. We got number 12 Florida right now. We're going off of the AP rankings because the new playoff rankings haven't come out. Number 12 Florida, number 2 Alabama at the moment. Alabama just needs to win this to get in. Florida could play spoiler and get a New Year's Six ball. Well, Alabama, we saw them last this past weekend against Auburn. Started off slow, had four field goals to start things off with 12 points. But Alabama has been too good against Florida in the past. They're 4-0 in their last four meetings, including a 2009 SEC title game. For Florida, 
They've got a defense that could keep them in it for a while, but Alabama is too good for anyone's defense. And how, what, what, what was it, Ricky? 47 carries? Mm-hmm. 47 carries for Derrick Henry this past weekend. Over 250 yards. I think it was 271 and a touchdown. Florida is 1-8 in its last nine games against Alabama. Alabama's 4-0 in its last four games. This one, Alabama is going to have to fight Florida a little bit in the first half. But as Alabama does so well and so often, they run away with it at the very end. I thought this was going to, like, before last week, I thought this was going to be the game to watch. And then it's like, oh, well, you just laid that dud against Florida State. The only reason I would want Florida to win is just for the shakeup in the just to make life on the committee hard. That's the only reason because I mean if Florida wins if Florida wins to me you have to me you have three situations that you can go through. Do you want to hear them? Yes, let's hear them. Number 1. You say to yourself, well, depending on how close the Big 10 championship is, if Alabama loses, you say to yourself, why not put both Big Ten teams in? Let's say that one's a blowout. Well, what if the ACC game is close? What if the Tar Heels would have to win it? The Michigan State and the Tar Heels would have to win in these situations for each of them. The ACC situation, well, what if the Tar Heels win? Why, why not put both one-loss ACC teams in? Or the third one for that fourth spot, you got to put a two-loss team in. So if Alabama loses, we're either looking at a one-loss team from the Big Ten or ACC getting in, or we're looking at a two-loss team. To me, that two-loss team could be Stanford. The reason being, they play this weekend. And if they win, it's one of those things where it's like, You've won, and the impression's there, whereas other two two lost teams, I mean, not two win teams, two lost teams, like Ohio State, they're not playing this weekend, so the impression's not there. Or if Alabama loses, do you keep Alabama and they just move to four? Like, it, the conversation would be too, like, me as a speculator, I'm loving the possibility of Florida winning. Do I see it happen? Probably not. Alabama or De- Derek Henry will probably roll over them, get the Heisman in the process. But it'd be fun to think about. I mean, it's they're interesting scenarios, but what would you do if Alabama lost? Would you keep them in or kick them out? A two loss Alabama team. You know, as much as I like Alabama, I can't keep them in. I can't in good conscience. Keep them in because especially, they wouldn't deserve to be in there. Especially if you have two one-loss teams in either the um, Big Ten or ACC. Well, yeah. I mean, after a while, you no longer can go with, oh, but they're an SEC team. You can do that as long as they're good and as long as they're winning. Then you can use that. But And even for one loss, you can use it. But if there's a two-loss team... And then you see an undefeated team. Can I throw a situation you, out at you? Can I finish this yeah, first? sorry. Then you have to put in the undefeated team. <laughs> I'm so polite. I even apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I see it. That's exactly how I see it. Alabama could not be in there with two losses if a team on the outside is undefeated. I'm going to throw a situation at you. Clemson wins. Iowa wins. Obviously, both those teams are in at undefeated. Stanford wins. They're, they'd be 11-2. and two. Florida wins. Now, Clemson and Iowa would jump to 1-2. We're not going to argue that order. Are we saying that Alabama is... Alabama lost against loses. Florida. Okay, yes. loses. Alabama lost. So your conference championships... Winners are Florida, Stanford, Iowa, Clemson. Obviously, Clemson and Iowa are in 1-2. 1-2. Oklahoma, 
who's probably going to stay in the top four. I don't know if they drop out from not playing. But with your other teams, Florida's technically your SEC champ. Stanford is technically your Pac-12 champ. Which two-loss team do you pick? North Carolina, Michigan State, who were losers. Or do you put a Stanford or do you say, screw it, Bama's still in? When Stanford's a two-loss team that won the Pac-12. Well, this this comes down to how much worth Our do you put on winning a conference championship? How big is that to you? How big is it winning one game in a conference championship setting? Or how big is it throughout the season winning multiple big games? Or if Houston, What does it come down to? Or if Houston wins, do you say, screw it, you're a one-loss team and a conference champion? No. You would say, <laughs> absolutely not. That's not even part of the discussion. <laughs> but, what, I mean, what do, you, what do you do, Ricky? If, if you're a rater, if you are one person on the committee, mm-hmm. if, what is more important to you? Is it Clem- more important? Is it more important if you win your conference championship game? Yes. I agree with that. You would agree I'm a, with that I'm a fan more so of conference than multiple big games throughout the season. I think it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, where you can't just win the conference championship. It's like basketball. You win, like in football, it's a little bit different because we only have four teams. But look at in basketball, you win your tournament. And you get an automatic bid. You win the regular season, you get an automatic bid. Of course, football it's one game. Yeah, with, basketball it's a couple. Well, you get two cracks at each team in your conference usually. But here's what I would do: if Clemson, Iowa, Stanford, and Florida all won this week, number one would be Clemson, number two would be Iowa. I would base that off of Clemson had more big wins than Iowa because you've got. North Carolina, you've got the Notre Dames, you've got the Florida State. Iowa had Michigan State. That's their they had three ranked opponents and they're not as tough as Clemson. So Iowa would be two, Clemson would be one. At number three, I'd keep Oklahoma in there. Only because Oklahoma, they won their conference. You can't hurt them for you can't hurt them because the Big 12 is a bunch of idiots and doesn't have a conference game. So I'd keep them at number three. And because they lost this week and Stanford would win, I'd put a two-loss Stanford team into the playoffs. Because to me, it would come down to, at that point, Stanford or Florida. Which conference champion do you put in? Stanford had a way better win over Notre Dame. <laughs> Florida had a loss to Florida State. So if that was the scenario, my playoff would be Clemson plays Stanford in the Orange Bowl, I believe, because I would believe Clemson would pick the closer game in Florida, whereas Iowa would play Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl. I would have Florida as my number four team. Because it's an SEC team. And Oklahoma. As a number three, no, because if Florida beats Alabama to in, in their well, conference, the number two and in their in their conference championship up. game, that's to me better than anything that Stanford would do. Well, Stanford because I can't I can't I can't uh, a win put o- the Pac-12 in front of the SEC. Well, and I can I I I can buy it only because Florida would have beaten the number two team Alabama, whereas Stanford you're beating a four loss SEC team. Or for the Trojans. This is kind of like your fuck it. We got nothing to lose game because you're eight and four after you fired Sarkeesian. Did anyone expect you to get to the Pac-12 championship game? I'm shaking my head, folks, because no, nobody did. And now you got a chance to beat a top 10 and maybe even a top five Stanford (laughs) with their win over Notre Dame. The playoff committee could put them in. The top five, probably that one out looking in, but yeah, to me, it's SC Stanford is the most dangerous game this week because USC, yeah, Florida has that nothing to lose, you could say, but nobody has that really nothing to lose than USC because they have four losses. I don't know what you think, though, Brandon. 
I don't know. I, I I still have to. I still have to go with Florida. I just think that they have had a tougher road overall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Florida State loss bad, um, but hey, a lot of people could say that at the very beginning of the season, Stanford real bad loss to Northwestern. So I think it kind of comes down to the very end, and Stanford's win against anybody in that Pac-12 is not as high to me as Florida's win over a Alabama, two Alabama, a number two Alabama team. <laughs> however, if that were to happen, however, again, these are just some scenarios, folks. However, it's not going to happen Brandon's like that. sitting there going, well, Alabama's going to win because we're all tied. But, oh, come on. but quickly before we sign things off, this was a Pac-12 championship that we were expecting Utah to be the team. Remember when Utah was undefeated? Yeah. Oh, they're a playoff team, and now they went what nine and three overall, six and three in the conference, and the Trojans got the tiebreaker over them. Yeah, we expected um, this Utah team to stay consistent, to stay um, really playing at a good level mm-hmm. throughout the entire season, and they fell off. And they fell when they fell off. They, they fell, fell off, off and faded. They just kind of, and the Pac-12 kind of faded all together, just like uh, Marcus Mariota and any chance of winning the NFL Rookie of the Year, because it looks like he's not going to win it. Why is that? I don't know. Just Jameis Winston's looked better. I watched Jameis Winston. How about about this? How about this? I know this is a little off. Oh, he's going to, yeah. Offensive Rookie of the Year, all day, every day, Todd Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley. I was just looking this, and this is a little side note, just talking about the college players as they look in the NFL. I hate the guy. I hate Jameis Winston, but I was watching him against the Colts. He threw a beautiful pass. I think it was to who fucking knows because his name wasn't Mike Evans in the end zone. I was just like, fuck, that was a beautiful pass. Like, that's exactly how I said it because I hate Jameis Winston. And then you look at Marcus Mariota throws an interception late in the game. It's like, GD, son, GD. But... You know, that happens to a lot of guys. Hey, Drew Brees didn't throw a uh, a touchdown pass this past week. No, he did not, but I did see a nice <laughs> touchdown pass from Marcus Mariota to Craig Stevens in the end zone. So, hey, you know, they they have their ups, they have their downs. You want to know what? And it it's called ha- being a rookie. And it doesn't help when uh, you go from playing with the Oregon Ducks to the Tennessee Titans. I was Well, I was going to say, yeah, it doesn't help when you go from having a lot of talent around <laughs> you to being the talent. <laughs> But that's going to do it for the Primetime Podcast this week. Let us know down below what you guys think of the Mark Rick firing the conference championship games we've got up ahead. We didn't give you all the picks, kind of gave you some of them for the complete lowdown of our championship week picks. Go ahead and check out our video later in the week. Usually goes up on Thursday for you guys. Wednesday, Thursday, depends on when we feel like posting it, go ahead and check that out. We're going to have all conference championship games this week getting ready for football. Who knows? Maybe one of these times coming up soon we'll throw some basketball into the Primetime Podcast because it's getting to that season. But that's going to do it for the Primetime Podcast. Brandon's at young underscore swan 19. I'm on Twitter at Ricky Widmer. Most Valuable Pod is at Most Valuable Pod. Thank you guys for checking this out. And as always, have a good day, everybody. Thank you for listening to this MVP podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Most Valuable Pod for more great podcasts.